Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. It's happy Friday. Everyone's so happy to be here. It's always good to have a Friday. Fridays are particularly fun for me because um, roughly once a month on Fridays, I do an inner circle webinar for my um, students. And it's that Friday of the month. We're gonna be talking about bet sizing on various streets. But today, because of um, lots of emails I've been getting, lots of things I've seen in the poker media, um, we're gonna talk about being results oriented. Where's Mr. James? He's having his breakfast. At 9 a.m., Mr. James has breakfast, which is a great time for me to do a little coffee because I know he is occupied. That said, once he's done, maybe I'll try to get him in here. Louis Philippe, good morning. Fernando, welcome. So, I got an email yesterday saying something to the effect of, on the bubble of a tournament, stone bubble, um, there's you know 50 people left, stone bubble. I raised the two big blinds with pocket jacks, perfectly fine. A short stack moves all in for 20 big blinds. Big stack jams all in for my 50 big blinds. What should I do with my jacks? In my mind, this is a super easy fold because first off, the guy who jams, yes, he could be quote unquote isolating or trying to get you off your hand with pocket tens or ace king or something like that. But even then, Jax has what, 55% equity? Do you really want to flip with 55% equity on the stone bubble when you have a solid medium stack? And the answer is definitely not. You want to collect your min cash. Min cash is free. When it's free, you just want to collect it. So easy fold. However, board ran out with the jack and the jacks would have won because the guy who shoved had ace queen. He was obviously isolating, right? And the ace queen would have won and had a big stack. But that is not good thinking. That is horrible thinking. And thinking like that because you would have won will make it very difficult for you to be a long-term winning poker player. Um, another good example of results-oriented thinking, um, that hand where the person made a big fold that everyone wanted to talk about on Wednesday, where the person folded um, second nut, or third nuts to a river check race. Sure, it works that time, and you know it, that actually could be a reasonable play if the opponent's never bluffing, but um, Athanasios is definitely a bluffer, so um, probably just not a good play, right? It's a results-oriented play. So why am I getting these emails? Why are these things appearing more mainstream. Well, I may be getting um, more of these emails because perhaps I'm becoming more mainstream, so that's lucky. As more people know me, I will inevitably be introduced to people who are more novice, right? And novice people, when they send me advice or ask me for advice, their questions are usually quite basic compared to the advice that is asked for me of uh, very good players. So uh, maybe I'm becoming more mainstream, but also I think more likely the content that's being produced by the poker media in general is trying to make poker sound exciting because of the um, the big plays, right? Um, they're trying to sensationalize poker, essentially. Make it seem like something it is not. Because what it actually is is perhaps not all that exciting. <laughs> Um, the idea of, you know, you make a play and you win some tiny bit of equity with that play, does that really matter? Like, no, you want to see the big swings. You want to see people's lives ruined and their lives made, right? That's what people like. It's like, you know, if people go to the gladiator, gladiator arena, they don't want to see two kids play until one of them loses their eye. They want to see them kill each other. Nickel Sagal, welcome. I'm on the platinum pass for, um... Stop smoking cigarettes, losing a lot of weight, getting in shape. I helped him prepare for the 25K, and um, he didn't win, so that's a bummer, but that's okay. However, in the time that we worked together, which really wasn't that long, he won another tournament online, so congrats on that. It's hard to win an online tournament. Um, anyway, people like to see big swings. They like to see cool things happen. I mean, one of the three types of poker players purely plays the game because they want to push the boundaries of the game, right? And people like pushing the boundaries of, of all games, right? You don't want to see just the normal grindy plays. You want to see the big crazy plays. I mean, this is why whenever you watch, um, you know, NFL highlights, you see the big plays. You don't see the plays where the guy runs for one yard, but often that's the bread and butter that sets up the big plays. And there are a lot of plays that set up the big plays. And that's, that's really part of the skill. 
Will there ever be a tournament like the Players' Championship in the future? Probably next year. Uh, this concept is nice since it makes poker look like a true sport. What do you mean by look? You mean the production quality? Um, I commentated it last year, and it was, uh, or the PCA last year that had this, the same set, and it, the production quality was amazing. So that was very nice. But um, I would venture to say that it is less like a true sport because, in theory, true sports have some sort of a um, very strict qualification system that ensures only the best players are playing. Whereas poker is a very different game because, in general, anyone can play, right? And in the, the PSBC, they were buying people in who, you know, who are definitely not used to playing $25,000 tournaments. And you essentially never see that in any regular sport, right? If you think about regular sports, the people who make it to the end are often the best in the world on a very regular basis. Very rarely in, like, tennis, for example, do you see someone who's number 10,000 in the world winning the tennis tournament. But we saw the PSPC, a guy who got his platinum pass for $0, won however much it was, $5 million or something like that. So... Um, I definitely think the production quality is great. They need to strive to have high production quality. But at the same time, I'm not sure if it is exactly a sport, right? Even if you look at esports, for example, there are often qualifiers and often there are um, barriers to entry. And, you know, often the barrier to entry in poker is just purely the money, right? Because, like, who has money to buy in for 25K? But if they remove that barrier, it changes things a bit. They awarded champions with passes, like D. Peters and Konakova. Yeah, sure. I agree. To be fair, I was there when David Peters got his platinum pass. It was hilarious. Um, I was there for the drawing because I was commentating last year. And the way David Peters got his pass is every tournament you play, you got a raffle ticket. They put your raffle ticket in a bin. They shuffled it up. Turns out David Peters probably had more raffle tickets than anybody else because he enters a lot of tournaments. They pull David Peters' name out <laughs> and uh, I send him a text immediately. Hey, you want a 25K pass? He's like, oh, sweet. <laughs> probably like the worst person to win. Uh, so that was fun. But um, anyway, the vast majority of Platinum Pass winners were not players who had played a 25k before. I think that's almost certainly true. So keep that in mind. Always, do, whenever you're looking at anything, don't look at the outliers. Look at the, the average or the median or whatever, right? You don't want to say, yeah, but this happened. Like, for example, whenever we see someone make a huge fold that's right, that's going to be right 2% of the time, don't say it's a good fold because it's right 2% of the time. I mean... Let's take a look at a few examples, right? Um, let's say we're playing basketball, okay? And we're... Oh, someone's calling me. Nope. Say we're um, down by one point, 20 seconds left. You get the ball. All you have to do is get two points to win. Hold the ball for a little bit, get two points, you win the game, easy game, right? Obviously, the team's going to try to foul you. Let's pretend like they can't foul you. Let's say instead of going for the easy two-point shot, you decide to go to the half-court line where no one's covering you because they're not worried about you taking a half-court shot, you shoot it, and it goes in. Now you're up by two. All you have to do is defend for 15 seconds. You win the game. Is that a good play? Obviously, the answer is no, because you're going to miss almost all of your half-court shots. But what if it works? Was it a good play? No, it was a stupid play, right? And sometimes, stupid plays get rewarded. What about um, looking poker, right? Say it folds you on the button, and you have... Ace three offsuit. Okay? Let's say you have 80 big blind effective stacks. What if you just shove all in? You can shove all in. The blinds are going to fold almost every time. And even more so than normal because you block the ace, right? Which means they, they're not going to have aces nearly as often. So your shove will get through a lot. But it's still lighting money on fire. Even though it's going to work, I don't even know, 90% of the time, maybe more. And you have to be aware that... Just because a play succeeds does not mean it is good, right? And for some reason, in poker, now, especially, it seems like everyone's saying that just because a play worked, that it must be good. And um, that's just straight up not true. And um, it's important to realize that plays are good because they win equity, right? But again, that's not cool <laughs> to win, you know, to win some tiny bit of equity by making a play. It's not exciting, right? Let's see what else I've written down here. How do you cure this thinking? Every single recreational player in the world, maybe all of them, whenever they approach poker, 
they are incredibly results oriented because that is the way that the vast majority of humans think because in most things in life you don't actually have a big sample right um just think about literally everything right i mean say say you go to work each day and you get paid you go to work each day and you get paid you expect to get paid and there's not, there's like no thought process there you, you don't have to calculate, oh, well, I get paid some days, or I not get paid some days. It has to be fair. If you work a commission job, then uh, maybe this is relevant. And But even then, like, say you go to work every day, 365 days a year, it's only 365 samples. If you look at something like poker, you need way more samples than 365 to have any idea of what is actually expected. I'm giving horrible analogies here. I apologize. I haven't really thought this through. I, this, this topic came to my mind because... I got that pocket jacks email like 10 minutes ago. Um, so anyway, what, what does cure this, um, this type of thinking? And I think the thing that is most helpful, the thing that cured it for me immediately, was putting in a lot of volume, right? If you play a lot of poker, you'll very quickly realize the results don't matter in the least bit. What matters is how much equity you win or lose with each decision. And this comes, it also helps you understand the game in general, right? The game is not about making huge folds and thinking you're some hero. Those are the type of players who succeed in medium and small stakes tournaments, but they never succeed in high stakes tournaments. The game is about making the right play in each scenario that you can based on long-term math. And um, it's very, very difficult for people to do that. Let's read some comments real quick, because I'm way behind. A few people understand the idea of the long-term. Yes, this is because they don't live in the long-term. Yeah, yeah, okay, so Mark, I completely agree. Your girlfriend is very interested in poker, but the broadcast last night was good enough to keep her for the full final table. Good. Let's see. The guy who won apparently won the Spanish leaderboard. Good for him. Let's see. Unless you're Steph Curry. Everybody likes Steph Curry taking his half point shots. You stream any Twitch sessions of mine? No, I live in America. I do not play online poker when I'm in America. Kyle, I'm not insulting the player who made the big fold with the ace queen. I am saying that it is very results oriented to say that that is a good fold. It's a different different things, right? We're not insulting anyone here. Understand that we are not trying to be rude or mean to anyone. I'm trying to help you all learn to play better poker. Again. Don't be results-oriented and think that I'm discussing one specific instance. I'm discussing lots and lots of instances using a few examples to give examples to you all, right? I mean, like, for example, the pocket jacks hand that I got emailed this morning where jacks raised, someone re-raised, someone went all in, or someone went all in, someone else went all in. Just an example. You could, you could um, change that in many, many ways, right? You could say you had ace-queen there. Still, still it's an easy fold. Um, saying you have a read, by the way, does not justify a play. If you trust your reads 100%, you'll probably go broke. It's well known. Even the best tell experts in the world highly recommend not relying on tells all that often. And also, understand, thinking you have a read on a very good player, and her opponent in that hand is a very good player. I don't know how many, much in cash he has. Let's look it up real quick. Can I do this without screwing up the computer? I was like anywhere near spelling his name right. Nowhere near. <laughs> Athanasios Polychronopoulos, uh, $2.3 million in live winnings, and also very good online player. So to think you have a read on a loose and aggressive player who is very good is quite egotistical. And it's not egotistical in that the person who says this thinks they are being egotistical. It's just a mindset that if you do understand what is actually being said with the actions, is essentially saying, I think this guy is so bad that I can look at him and tell what he's doing. And um, I, I would not think that about any good player. Let's see. King said, you stop smoking cigarettes, weed, quit energy drinks. Fantastic. Energy drinks are a thing that I didn't even realize people were still doing. But apparently lots of people drink lots of energy drinks. Get off those, please. If nothing good comes from that. The only energy drink I think is acceptable is uh, coffee and tea at this point in life, and you need to not be on those so hard. I used to drink um, two two liters of Coca-Cola every day, 
I got fat, and eventually I realized that I was making lots of poor decisions, and I changed my life. You can read a blog about that at um, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash how I lost 40 pounds, 40. How I lost 40 pounds. And um, check that out. Let's see. You don't understand that if you only play live, you never play enough hands to be significantly, statistically significant. So, one can easily have sampling error. Having said that, you agree. I mean, listen. Live, you are not. You're gonna have a very hard time getting to the long run, but it still is something you can average out. Not just based on you, but based on the population, right? Um, for example, in tournaments, there are a lot of players, a lot, a lot, a lot of players, who are very good, who have ran below expectation. So does that mean they are bad, or does that mean just they're running below expectation? Um, I know in live poker, for example, for a while, and Christian Harder was a great example of this, everyone thought he was one of the best players in the world. He was one of the best online players in the world, or is, is, was, whatever. And he never really had a big score at all for a long time, like 10 years. And does that mean he's bad? Does that mean he's just awful at live poker? Everyone who looked and watched him play realized he's very, very good. So what's happening? Well, he's just unlucky in the few big spots he gets. So you have to not only average your results, you have to look at the player pool results and compare them to the players who are similar to you in skill level and see what their results are across the board. And you're not going to always get the results you want, and that's okay. You don't get to pick which end of the spectrum you're on, and that's okay. If you were to compare general field of players today versus 10 years ago, what would be the key differences in game style? Well, back in the day, they were just weak and bad. Now they'll fight. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Stupid players getting rewarded is part of the game. Understand they're not stupid. Very often, if you're making poor poker plays, you're actually a genius at life because you have enough money to lose at poker. And there is luck element, a luck element, and that is why poker is good. Understand, if there was no variance in poker, what would we be playing? Well, we'd be playing a game like chess. How many people play chess for money? Like, almost no. Right? No. Like, almost no, no people succeed at chess and make significant money. Maybe, you know, five or ten people. How many people make money from poker? A whole lot of them, right? And not just a little bit of money. I mean, like, at least a decent amount, like 50K a year or something. A lot of people make 50K a year from poker. No one, or almost no one, makes 50K a year from chess. And that's because chess is a very skill-oriented game. There's more skill involved in chess than in poker. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. There is way more variance in poker. How about that? There's more variance in poker than there is in chess. Uh, poker may be a little bit more skill intensive. I'm not exactly sure. That'd be an interesting question. Because, you know, computers can essentially solve chess, or very close to solve chess, whereas they have a much more difficult time doing that with poker, although I guess they're kind of there already. I guess in theory, the, the more difficult it is to compute the optimal strategy of a game, that me makes it more skill intensive. Just because a game has variance does not mean it's not skill intensive, though. Let's see. Double Barrel Riot. Would you suggest, any, any questions about bankroll, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. They have healthy energy drinks now. Um, this, this right here is the best energy drink in the world. I have it. I have it all day, every day. I don't know if you can see it. It's water. It's been scientifically proven, apparently. You do not need things like electrolytes and whatnot. You don't need caffeine. You don't need any of these things. In the ideal world... You do not need any of those things in your life. They are essentially crutches to prop up other bad behaviors. Why do I need coffee in the morning? Gonna stay up too late. I work too hard. I probably drink a little bit at the end of the day. Why do I have that? Because I um, probably have other issues, right? They're all crutches. Ideally, you don't want any crutches. Um... JB, what value hands can she beat? That's not the question. And what are the potential bluffs? Any hand with an ace. Any hand with a king. Everyone keeps saying, what are the bluffs? Well, they, those people who say this don't understand that if you are good, you always have a bluffing range. 
And the hands that you want to be bluffing with block the nut hands. All right, let's see. You used to play money for chess on Venice Beach. That was a few years ago. Good job. How do you increase your playing time? Make it a priority. Let's see. Changing thinking also takes study. Who do we follow? Or who do I recommend you follow to um, get good at poker? I mean, I know I've heard a lot of good things about Ben CB's site. Um, I have not subscribed to the site, so I don't know for sure, but I've watched some of his videos. Those are good. Very, very good, strong player who has a good mindset. Um, run it once. They have a lot of good videos there. My site, pokercoaching.com. Alex Fitzgerald and Matt Affleck also make quizzes for us, so check those out. All those are good. I would generally tell you to, again, very blanket statement. There are good people here, but I would tell you to avoid lots of the content that is just, mm, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. If people are trying to actively get clicks and they don't necessarily have amazing poker results, you probably don't need to be studying from them. You want to make sure you're studying from good people. Clint says pokercoaching.com. It's all you need. Yeah, well, there you go. It's tough, right? Because, I, I mean, I wrote this in my very first poker book, that you don't actually have to be good at poker to write a poker book. You don't actually have to be good at poker to have a YouTube channel or have a Twitch channel or have a little coffee in the morning. You don't actually have to be good. And it's really, really tough to know if um, the person you're listening to is actually good. Because everyone says they're good. If they say they're good, that may be a um, red flag right off the bat, right? If someone acts like they're great, they think they're great, they try to be flashy, understand all these things are often warning signs. I mean, you see uh, this guy, Ty Lopez, all the time on YouTube trying to advertise how great he is and whatnot. And um, there's all sorts of videos just proving how this guy's essentially... Um, I'm not going to say a scammer, but he's, he's puffing up, right, to get clicks. And that's, um, that's a thing, right? You can look exactly how you want for any short period of time. And if someone's putting out a little bit of content here and there, 20 or 30 or an hour long a day, it's not so hard to look amazing for an hour a day. And you have to be able to discern what is good and what is bad. And that's hard. It's really, really hard to do. So how do you do that? You get recommendations from other people who you respect. If everyone respects someone, they're probably pretty decent. Um, it's hard. It's hard to know who to trust. Is Deuces Crack legit? Um, I haven't been a subscriber to Deuces Crack for like 10 years. They were one of the older training sites. Um, we actually considered combining with them a long time ago. Combining my site with their site, but it did not happen. Um, they had a great site a long time ago. I don't, I don't know anything about today. Let's see. You say you play worse after a certain number of amount of time. I suggest you look into the work by Elliot Rowe or Trisha Cardner. I think that will be very, very useful for you. Um, they, they do a lot of work with mindset. And you may, you may have some mindset issues that makes you get antsy after a while. Sports betting will be the only focus for the next decade. Maybe. Um, the problem with sports betting in America, there's a huge problem with it. You know what the huge problem is? If you know the huge problem, let me know. I know the answer. I know the huge problem. Make sure you vet whoever's content that you work with. I mean, that's the problem is it's like, how do you vet it if you're not good yourself, right? When a hundred dollars is splashed in the pot at two five, should the first raise be to one twenty? Um, yes, it should be huge. Because the pot's huge. All right, let's see. Louis Philippe says, you saw yesterday by Poker Stars when Pierce cracks ace-king with king-six, gets a six on the turn, calling the all in preflop. Why does PKS, I don't know what PKS is. Maybe you mean Poker Stars. Why do they present the game like this? They're presenting the fun things, right? They're showing a celebrity... Um, cracking someone. Got him, ha ha, look at this. Anyone can win. Am I coming to the playground in January? Oh no, I have a, I have a baby. Everyone's giving the wrong answer. The huge problem with sports betting in America, at least right now, is that the rake is through the roof. If you look at a lot of the lines and a lot of American 
uh, outfits that are open, the lines are like 20 cent lines or 30 cent lines, which are definitively unbeatable. So it's a game where even if you have any sort of skill, it's going to win you three or four percent. And if you, you know, if you're paying five percent rake or two and a half percent rake, and you have a little bit of skill, or even a lot of skill, that gets you a little bit of an edge, you can beat it. Um, so, essentially, currently, the games that are being offered are definitively unbeatable. And that's a problem, right? They need to offer games that are at least a little bit live if they want to turn it into something like poker. That said, I don't think they want to turn it into something like poker. We've seen what happened with Daily Fantasy Sports. I mean, nothing huge has come from that. And um, that's like the closest sports are going to get to poker. And, you know, they're fine, but it's not like they're crushing it, right? It's not like it's become the next poker. It was for, for a minute until people realized how skill-intensive it was. And once it becomes skill-intensive and also easily solvable by supercomputers, which it has been solved, essentially. Once, once you solve the game, the game starts to die off. And one big problem with the daily fantasy sports, I think, is they allowed all these multi-entries to try to get around various laws. And the multi-entries, well, like in poker, <laughs> heavily favor good players. And the good players scooped up all the money very fast. Right? And if the good players scoop up all the money very fast, then the game dies. Poker is great because the good players don't get to scoop up all the money very fast. Do I know any sites that accept Australian players? I have no clue about Australian gaming regulations. I'm sorry. Imagine all the... Uh, Shady ones that accept American players often accept, also accept Australian players. That said, do not put your um, money on any site that's not fully regulated and licensed. Unless you don't care about losing it. Where am I from? I'm from Pensacola, Florida. So 99%. Um, the issue here is that sports betting as it is currently set up in casinos is a game like roulette where no one's going to win. It's well known that um, essentially no one wins. The people who do win are the super geniuses with supercomputers and giant teams. And that is not the case for 99% of people. If that was what was required to be good at poker, uh, there wouldn't be very many good poker players. What's my college major? Engineering and psychology, but I quit rather early because I majored in poker. Anyway, if, if you're playing against like 15 cent lines or more, you're just not going to win. Shadow knows Pensacola. All right, let's see. When playing live cash games, you have a tendency to want to leave and book a win. Do you have any advice for overcoming this mental block? Realize that you make money every hand that is dealt if you're a winning player. Again, if you're up only because you were lucky, probably shouldn't be playing in the first place, right? If you're up because you're actually good and you have a skill advantage, then you want to play as long as you can. Every hand that is dealt gives you money. What happens at the end of the day is completely irrelevant. Go read jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. Everyone asks me if I'm going to a tournament. I'm not going to any tournaments until May, unless something comes up. I have a baby. It is not a responsible thing, in my opinion, for a dad to do, to leave his wife and his kids, um, at least for a while. Obviously, you have to get back to work at some point. But if you can swing it, then it's fine. DJ says he's being ignored. DJ, you have to understand that I am um, streaming on three different devices right now, and I do my best to catch everyone. But on Instagram, I don't know if you know how Instagram works, but they don't actually put up very many comments at a time. So if, if I don't catch it in like one minute, just or 20 seconds sometimes, it just scrolls right through. Anyway, going back to being results-oriented. Volume cures this. How do you get in volume? Well, like we already discussed in live poker, you can't really. So to determine your actual win rate, don't actually look at your win rate but also everyone else's win rate who are comparable players to you. And if you look at that, you can determine what your actual win rate is and what your expectation is, assuming you're good enough at assessing your skill level. And if you look at your... Well, you have to ask, how do your opponent or how do your peers perceive you? It's pretty well known who's decently good. And if the top 50 poker players in the world think you're also one of the top 50 poker players in the world... You probably are. I mean, from what I understand, this happened with Stefan Sondheimer for a while. Um, I remember Fedor Holtz had this deck of cards that had all the super high roller players on it. And um, Sondheimer was on it. And his luck factor was like 1 out of 10. 
So apparently everyone thought he was really good, but one out of ten in terms of luck. And he like never won anything. And then all of a sudden he just started winning. And David Peters is another good example of this, right? Um, I remember the day before he had his first 10K win, we were standing in the kitchen in Malta. And he was like, man, if I just never played 10Ks, I'd have so much more money. And <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's true. Everyone thinks you're great, though. I mean, if everyone thinks you're great, you're probably just great. And sure enough, he won that 10K, and then he won every other tournament. So understand that the variance is crazy. Am I going to go play Borgata at all? Understand what I just said one second ago. I'm not going anywhere until May. If there's a Borgata tournament in um, August or September, I may go. But no. You all have to understand. At this point in my life, if I go play a Borgata tournament, maybe I make... Let's say I go play the 3500 I may make, what, $2,000 on average if I'm good? Um, so if I make $2,000 on average, am I going to leave my family and my wife with a three-week-old and also a two-year-old for four days to make $2,000. A lot of people would, and a lot of people need to. Fortunately, we don't need to. So if you don't need to, why do it? Also, remember, I'm not playing poker to pass time. A lot of people play poker because they want to pass the time or because they like to play poker. I like to play poker, but I like supporting my family more. Do I still live in New Jersey? I've never lived in New Jersey. What percentage of poker players are winners? Depends on how you phrase that question. What percentage are up $1 or more at the end of the year? Probably actually a decent amount. A lot of those people play five sessions and then don't play anymore. Or a lot of those um, have a tournament win and then don't play anymore. But a lot of the time at the end of the day, a lot of those players who win turn around and play bigger and bigger and bigger and all that money trickles to the top. So at the small stakes, not a whole lot of players win long-term because all that money trickles up to the top. Am I coming to Florida anytime? No, no, we're not, we're not going anywhere until May. And then I'm going to go to Vegas for the World Poker Tour Championship, Tournament of Champions. I don't know if they have a championship. I'm going to the Tournament of Champions in May. Oh, let's see. Do you have any idea of what the live poker scene is like in Malta? No, I have no idea about Mal Maltese poker. I suggest if you have any idea, or want to have ideas about Maltese poker, ask people who live in Malta. I know... Um, Phil Grusium lives there, I think. Also, there's a lady. Oh, what's her name? She's always streaming on Party Poker. <sighs> My mind's blanking. I'm sorry. She interviewed me. I'm so bad with names. Uh, she lives there as well, so check that out. Are we doing any kind of meetup during the World Series? I'm sure we'll figure something out like that. Anyway, um, volume. So, if you actually want to see if you're a good winning player, what do you do to put in volume? You know the answer? It's an easy answer. Play online poker. Online poker is great for putting in volume, and it's also great for playing against good competition. Good competition meaning tough competition. If you can beat online poker, hey, Monia, that's it. There you go. Her name is Monica. There you go. Hey, Monia. Uh, she's also in Malta, so ask her and Phil Grusium. Thank you. I knew someone would know it. You all know everything out there. Um, what you need to do is you need to play online poker. You need to play a lot of volume. You don't have to play even big stakes. If you can beat small stakes online, you are going to be good enough to beat the vast majority of live poker games, as long as they're not just like 50 times the size. Um, if you can beat $20 tournaments online, you're going to be fine in $200 live tournaments. It's going to be like a joke playing a $200 live tournament. Um, if you can beat 1 to No Limit online, you're definitely going to be able to beat 510, maybe even 1020 live. So do that. Play a ton and get in a lot of volume. Understand, though, that whenever you're playing, if the goal is to put in volume, the goal is not necessarily to improve your skills, so you have to balance those two things, right? You don't need to sit there and 16 table all day. You probably need to play like six tables, or maybe two or three tables of the speed tables, and that's going to allow you to get in, you know, three or four thousand hands a day if you play a decent amount. And if you play three or four thousand hands a day, you'll get to, how long will it take you to get 100,000 hands? It'll take you 25 days, right? So in a year, you'll have a million hands. If you play a million hands of poker, and this can be done, you know, six or seven hours a day, which if you are actually dedicated to what you're saying here, uh, if you're dedicated to this, you will put in your six or seven hours because you actually care. Like whenever I was going to college and working a job, I was still playing five or six hours of poker a day. I just was neglecting sleep and, and uh, relationships and friends and everything else. 
And that's okay. I realized the sacrifice I was making. It was important to me. A lot of people don't actually prioritize poker. And if you don't prioritize it, understand you're not going to get the data you need to know if you're a good player. The reason my parents were so cool with me dropping out of college and quitting my job is because I had lots and lots of data. Whenever I quit, I had already played something like 10,000 sit and goes. And I already proven I'm winning about $20 per game. It's pretty solid data. I showed the downswings, I showed the upswings. I showed, look, if a bad downswing is 20 or 30 or 40K, I'm sitting here with whatever it was, 100 or 200K in the bank, and that's okay. And they were cool with it because I had lots of data. A lot of people try to get into things like poker and they instead win for a month and think, oh my God, I'm the best player in the world, and that's not good. You're trying to average 50K hands a month, but your concern is how can you ever do that live? You can't, but live you have a way higher win rate. I mean, for example, at 1-2 at, uh, online, you may be able to win, like, what, 10 big blinds for 100 hands? Whereas in live, you can win tw uh, 10 big blinds per hour. So that's $20 an hour. So that's 60 big blinds per 100 hands. So 60 big blinds per 100 hand win rate live. Is that right? 10, 20, 30. I'm sorry, 30 big blinds per 100 hand win rate live versus 5 um, online. So you have a significantly higher win rate if you're good. You're playing 10 cent, 25 cent online and one, two live, but you win more big blind per hour live. Yeah, obviously, uh, yeah, you will. You will win more big blinds per hour because the game's softer. People are way worse live. Um, is the tournament champion the free roll? No, it's, um, I don't actually know what it is this year. Last year it was a $15,000 buy-in and I think they added a little bit of money to the prize pool. So there's like no rake and they add some money and they give you a nice gift bag. It's a good tournament. You should play. If you're a champion, you should play. Which online games would you play if I had to start from scratch? Sit and goes. I know how to play sit and goes great, and I know I can grind up a lot of money from nothing quickly. Talal, who made the final table, is a high stakes crusher. Yes, Talal is a very good player. Talal plays all the high rollers. He was a hedge fund, was or is a hedge fund manager. Um, so, yeah, he does great. My parents were cool because of my results in poker. They were cool because of the data. I can guarantee you, if I got, let's say whenever I, let's, let's pretend like I had 200K whenever I quit college. If I instead got 200K from winning a poker tournament, one tournament, they would not be cool with that. Because my parents are reasonable. They can look at numbers and say, okay, you got lucky one time, therefore you got lucky one time, right? Instead, I played 10,000 games and shown you're not going to get lucky for 10,000 games, right? You can even get lucky for 500 or 1,000 games, but you're not going to get lucky for 10,000 games. What tracker app do I suggest for live? I don't know. Find one on, on the iTunes app store. I actually don't know what a good one is at this point. I just use Excel. How do you know when to end a profitable session? Whenever, the turn, whenever you are ready to go. Go to jonathanlillpoker.com slash bankroll. What are the dates for the Tournament of Champions? I think it is the last day of May, I believe. What stakes are equivalent, live versus online? I would generally say um, you can roughly 5 or 10x the stakes live to online. Then you make a really, really bad question. And the bad, the bad question is, can a person who beats $10 sit and goes beat live multi-table tournaments? Two different games. I lost a boatload of money whenever I first started to play live poker because I was a great sit-and-go player, and I assumed because I was a great sit-and-go player, I must be good at poker. Or, not even poker, but no limit hold'em. I was not that egotistical to think I'd be good at seven-card stud or PLO. Um, I realized, I thought I was good at no limit hold'em. I didn't realize the games were different. Sit-and-goes are not tournaments. I sat there, I played a great sit-and-go strategy, and I lost my ass. So... Um, how much can a $10 sit-and-go player with a 10% ROI win in multi-table tournaments? You'll probably lose a lot if you use that strategy. Understand that the games are different, right? Six-handed games are different than nine-handed. Nine-handed is different than tournaments. Tournaments are different than sit-and-goes, etc., etc. What makes a good sit-and-go player? A very good understanding of math and knowing how to play all the spots. Sit-and-goes are very easy forms of poker because they're often played very shallow stack, right? And shallow stack poker is quite easy because there are only 
5,000 questions you have to know how to answer. If you answer those 5,000 questions perfectly, then you got it. You just have to learn how to answer those 5,000 questions. I learned to answer those 5,000 questions when I was 18 years old by playing for six hours, studying all of those games using a program back then called Sit and Go Power Tools, which is a very, very uh, simple version of what ICMizer is today. And then I would um, play another six hours and I would review all those hands. I did that all day, every day for three years and got very good. Let's see. Cashing way less now, why? <laughs> Listen, try, try to put full sentences in, please. Um, if you're cashing less, you have to ask how many samples do you have? Are you cashing less over a 1,000 game sample or cashing, cashing less over the last month, right? Everyone who asks me this question, I'm cashing less over the last month, what am I doing wrong? And the answer is you are nothing. You're probably playing the same. You have to understand, most people, listen, if you ask me this question, this is gonna sound very rude. If you're asking me this question, I'm cashing less over the last month, what's going on? Or I'm cashing less over the last year of live poker, what's going on? You're probably not very good at poker because you are asking a really, really poor question. First off, it doesn't really matter what your cash rate is. What matters is what your return on investment is. Next, understand that if you play 200 tournaments a year, that's like no sample. You're going to have huge swings. I mean, I've had 30 or 40 out of the money in a row in live poker. I mean, and that's in soft games, right? So that's just normal. That's normal variance. And imagine if you just break 40 in a row and then have a normal normal uh, cash session or a normal cash sequence for the rest of the year, you're going to cash like, I don't know, 7% of the time. You like everything about my stream except for you now have to give up monster energy drinks. I'm not, I have nothing against Monster Energy drinks. Um, get off of all energy drinks. To be fair, here I am drinking my energy drink right now every morning, a little coffee. Ideally, if you can pull it off, you want to put the minimum number of random substances into your body if possible. I'm pretty convinced that that is a very good idea. And um, it's hard to do. I have my coffee and my wine. <laughs> is six or nine handed harder? Well, what are the differences? Skydive, what are the differences between six and nine handed? Let's see. Callum says there's a game with no rake. If 25 to 1 was normally enough to enough of a bankroll, 25 buy-ins, how much less can you get away with? I honestly don't know. Do some math. Would you ever do a video on software premium or free for poker? Uh, Jarvi, I'm not sure what you're asking. I do have videos on um, ICMizer. I like that program. I have videos on Poker Snowy. I like that program. Those are all on YouTube. I should do a little coffee on asking the right questions. It's hard to know how to write. I mean, I don't even know how to answer the right questions. Louis Flutes says, one of your friends put in a lot of volume and is disgruntled when I show him the math for a play. He, flight, he fights you and prefers to stick to his own opinion. What would you say to that player? Realize that your opinion does not matter. All that matters is the math behind a play. Um, someone asked me recently on Facebook, and they essentially said, with this big blind ante, what do we do now? How do we change our strategy when we're shallow stacked? And uh, the answer is no one really knows right now. Because you, should be j you obviously should be jamming from earlier positions wider because you take the big blind that's just gone out of your stack, right? So if that's the case, you should be shoving wide, obviously. Question is how wide? I had a spot like this in the Montreal tournament where I took eighth place. Um, I jammed under the gun with a seven offsuit for five big blinds, which is normally a three big blind shove. But I think it's good, I think it's better. And then I asked Sorel Mizzy, who's someone who I respect, and he's like, oh yeah, easy shove. <laughs> so maybe I should have shoved the nine three suited to him before, who knows? But um, the opinion of people, though, does not really matter. So the person said, yeah, I don't really feel comfortable with jamming the 8-7 offsuit in that spot. My opinion is that blank and blank and blank, whatever his opinion was. His opinion is completely irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't even count. My opinion doesn't even count. If you can use math to solve the problem, that's what matters. And fortunately, in poker, in shallow stack scenarios, 
you can solve it very easily with math. Um, the problem with the big money any problem is that uh, future game simulations need to be used, and those are barely accurate right now. Let's see. You're on bulletproof tea with honey and ginger and turmeric. Yeah, sure, do whatever you want. Be careful about the coconut oil. I've read a lot about how coconut oil in high quantities can actually be quite bad for you. I was on it for a while and uh, gained a lot of weight, so be aware of that. Oh yeah, Cabernet Sauvignon for me. That's where that's what I go to. How much time have I put into learning live tells? A lot. I've, I've studied a decent amount of live tells. What is this lion behind me? My wife got this for me for um, my birthday. This is my birthday present. It's a unicorn lion. Maybe my spirit animal. I, I really need a unicorn shark. Um, I saw this in the zoo and thought it was super cute and wanted to get it for James slash myself. And, um, it's cute, right? All right. Let's make sure we can see the unicorn. There we go. Let's see. Live tells are very important. Live tells are especially beneficial when you're playing against bad players. I just realized my microphone's way over here. <laughs> um, has the mic, has the sound been okay today? If you're on YouTube or, or Twitch, let me know. But yeah, I mean, Louis Philippe, a lot of people have the ego problem of thinking that what they think matters in a game that is based purely on math. And you'll, you'll learn that your, your um, opinion doesn't matter if you play a lot and you just start losing all the time, right? If you lose all the time, you'll realize your thoughts don't matter. Most people go broke before they figure that out, though. Do I think Short Neck is the game of the future? No. A lot of people thought um, PLO is the game of the future. It's obviously not. A lot of people thought mixed games were the game of the future. Obviously, they're not. No Limit Hold'em is the king of games. Um, I don't even think Short Neck's going to catch on, personally. But it may. Isn't a isn't a narwhal a narwhal a unicorn shark? Uh, pretty much is, yeah. <laughs> Sound is fine, good. I have this microphone. Normally it's sitting like right up here, but today it was just like way over here. We'll just leave it here. It's, it's way out of the way, that's for sure. All right. What else do y'all want to talk about? I'm gonna go soon. What's my favorite book from this shelf behind me? Mm. I like all these books behind me. I don't really have books on the bookshelf that I'm not a fan of. The book that changed my life the most was The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. That started all of this. All of these books back here. I wrote or had my hand in most of these. Um, all those came about because I read Tim Ferriss' book, The Four Hour Work Week, and got to work, working um, 60 hours a week. Every week for the last um, 15 years. Would you ever go back to live at the bike? Yeah, sure. I'm always willing to go play games. How can you win more flips? Be luckier. Let's see. Like martial arts, you believe having one master. I'm not so sure that's true. Should you have just one poker trainer? Um, no. I think you should study from lots of people. But understand that you need to make sure you're studying from actual good people. Lexi, good morning. Will I be Borgata? No, I have a baby. I do not think it's responsible for me to leave my wife and my baby and my other baby for at least a little while. And fortunately, I've set up life to where I don't have to go anywhere until May. Unless something very, very enticing comes up. And um, we discussed this earlier, that if I make, let's say, $2,000 by playing a 3500 but I have to be gone for four days, is it worth $500 a day to leave my wife and my baby right now? But I know my wife is tired and uh, my baby's little. It's probably just not worth 2000 bucks. So, you won't see me. What's the inner circle topic for today? Bet sizing in various scenarios. And Mark, if you don't have interesting hands, just sit back and listen to everyone else's interesting hands. What's my newest book going to be about? I, I'm almost finished editing Modern Poker Theory by Michael Acevedo. It is going to be a game changer. 
I'm learning a lot from it. Can you make a sample video of how to do a homework question? I believe I did, Fernando. Um, you need to go to the range analyzer, and there's a video on how to use the range analyzer, so check that out. Yeah, Alexi, I'd like to go play, but, um, you know, priorities. <laughs> All the books are about to fall over. The name of that book is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. It got me off my rump and got me to working. How much for a membership on my site? $40 a month or usually you can get a year for $150, bucks, give or take. This book is good. Not everything in it is useful, but this is the book that has definitely had the most influence What's the book I like the most? I'm just going to turn around and find one that I like a lot. Let's see. Mm. Mm, here's one. I like this book a lot. Mike Sexton's Life's a Gamble. Lots and lots of good, fun gambling stories. There's some pictures in here. Let's see if I can find some. There's Mike Sexton doing gymnastics. What a dreamy man, am I right? There's him in the military, et cetera, et cetera. I like Mike Sexton a lot. I've worked with Mike Sexton a decent amount. And um, I don't know, I, 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 like, I like him. And I like that I was able to help him get this biography made. It's published by my publishers, D&B Poker. They have all sorts of good books. And um, they have lots of good books coming out in the near future, which I had, um, I had my hand in pretty much all of them. So that's good. I'm glad that we're getting good work done. But I like this book, Life's a Gamble. What else do I like? No. Eh. All right. Am I playing online right now? Does it look like I'm playing online right now? Yeah, how do you win more flips? Take more flips. Easy example. Softest online site, the ones that have lots of sports betters on them. Um... Cabo says you like the three-headed Hydra technique. Uh, little Affleck and Assassinato, Assassinato, all at PokerCoaching.com. That's right. Can we fold queens late in tournaments? Sure, if they have a much stronger range than you. If the math of likelihood of strong hand being behind you in your early position, does that mathematically mean that more folds, the more likely that the late position players have strong hands? This is discussed in Modern Poker Theory by Michael Acevedo. This is called the bunching effect. Essentially, if you're playing nine-handed and you're on the button and everyone folds to you, in theory they, and in practice, they should fold mostly low cards, right? Which means the players yet to act have strong cards, which means that you should be opening tighter on the button nine-handed than if instead you were playing three-handed and you were on the button. So that does exist. It usually accounts for three or four percent tighter range as there are more players at the table, like nine-handed versus three-handed. That said, usually whenever you're playing nine-handed, there's more antis in the pot. Which makes you also open want to also makes you want to open a little bit wider. <laughs> I, I did not actually see this part of the webinar. Um, the five things Alex Fitzgerald said. He's not even close to my skill level. Am I really that good? I don't know. I try my best. It's hard to know like how good you are and what defines good. When's that book, Modern Poker Theory, supposed to come out? It's supposed to come out this summer. I don't know. We're still waiting on Michael to finish up a little bit. He's been busy winning every online tournament. Um, he's, he's an interesting character because he essentially stopped playing poker or mostly didn't play poker for like three or four years and purely tried to solve the game. That's all he did. Spent tons of money on supercomputers solving poker and teaching other people how to beat it. Um, I actually was introduced to him through the Pokar backing company, and he was... I watched his training videos, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy's good. And as soon as um, my publisher, or I was trying to present ideas to the publisher, I'm like, we need a game theory book by this guy. And yeah, it's great. Um, since he's basically solved the game now, he has all the data. Now all he has to do is um, play. And so he won a scoop event, took like third in a big W coop, took third in the $500 tournament last week. I mean, he just wins all the time. It's insane. It's really insane. Sick player. Sick player and sick uh, sick coach, essentially. Problem is, his English is not so well um, because he's from Costa Rica, I believe. So I've had to clean up the book a decent amount, but that's fine. The content's amazing. 
Did I help with Poker 101? I have looked at it. I, I did not help make it, though. That is Alex Fitzgerald's product. How is he live? Good live player as well. I mean, it's all, it's all the same. What's his name? Michael Acevedo. A-C-E-V-E-D-O. Let's see. Your tournament caches have decreased. I mean, that's just part of the game. Sometimes you're going to run poorly. What's the time frame on these streams? We cap it at an hour because Instagram caps me at an hour. 9 a.m. Monday to Friday. How do you get the $50 a year coaching from you? I'm not, I have no clue what you're talking about, John. Send an email to support at pokercoaching.com. Just got mastering small stakes on the audio. You cannot find the charts. Go to D and B, D A N D B, poker.com slash mastering charts. Michael Acevedo, very good player. He was, I think, at the highest, like, number 10 online, despite just never playing. You can be number 10 online, and number 10 in the world online and never play. I mean, that's, that's pretty sick. Um, oh, yeah, not Monday to Friday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Thank you for the correction. You're absolutely right. You know, I was talking to one of my business mentors the other day, and he essentially said, I have, like, a bazillion things going through my mind that I somehow keep pretty good track of. He says that most people have like three things in their business. He says, I have like a hundred. <laughs> and somehow I do it. Are players better at small stakes or high stakes? Obviously players are better as you move up. What do we charge an hour for private coaching? We have upped it, $500 an hour. I am gonna be honest, I, don't, I think that's a little bit too high, but it's become a supply and demand issue. Like when Phil Helmuth charges $10,000 for coaching, um, it's definitely not worth it, but supply and demand, right? I have almost no time, and I don't really need or want private students because private students, whenever I help them, I help exactly one person at a time. And when you help only one person at a time, given I have the ability to help all of you at a time, then um, I'd rather help a lot of people than one person. Is there a military discount? There's not, there's, there are no discounts, sorry. Um, if you want semi-private coaching though, go to pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. That is roughly $100 a month. And there we have two office hours every week for two hours each. I'm sorry, they're not two hours each. They've turned into four or five hours now because we have too many members <laughs> where I present on a topic. Today we're discussing various best sizes and the purpose of them. And then we also answer whatever questions they send in until they're done asking questions, which usually ends up being about three or four hours long. So um, those are good. Those also allow me to go through specific hands and give very specific advice. And it's good. So if you want coaching for me for about, you know, 15 minutes every two weeks for hundred bucks a month, so 50 bucks a session, and you get to listen to the, the strategy sessions where I present on the topics and also answer everyone else's questions, check that out. What is the one skill lesson from online you feel translates to live? The games are the same. Just players live are way worse. How did that alternate board get started? I honestly have no clue. I got started in it because one of the other people who I work with um, was in it a long time ago and he suggested I get in it. Hey, is James available? I don't think James is available. All right, I'm going to go. You all have a great day. Hope you enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Don't be vulgar. Nothing good comes from vulgarity. Which game is easier, 2-5 or 5-10? We already answered that. 2-5 is easier because the game's smaller. Um, what's today? Today's Friday. People want to ask what my next book is. Um, thank you, a little coffee. We have currently... I don't know, 100 topics, give or take. That means I've sat here for 100 hours with all of you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, happy to keep doing it. Have fun. Good luck. I will see you on Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. If you're in the Inner Circle, I'll see you today at 2 p.m. So in a few hours, make sure you get your questions sent in. I'm happy to answer them. I want to answer them. Make sure you take full advantage of me. So good. Connor says, that tournament I wish you luck on, you won. Good job. <laughs> Have a great day.